The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. She is the director of Kids on Stage in Mount Pleasant. Um, we just discovered we went to school the same place. I still live in Cookville where she went to Tennessee Tech. Um, I'm excited about this session, Cindy, because I work in a STEM platform school with music but no visual arts at all. So um, I can't wait to hear what you have to say and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. My name is Cindy Pride and I'm the Kids on Stage Director at uh, Mount Pleasant STEAM Innovation Campus. Uh, for many years before we had a STEAM campus, I was the Kids on Stage coordinator at the middle school, which is a middle school of the visual and performing arts. I do have an arts background, I have a Bachelor of um, Instrumental Music from Tennessee Tech. I taught in the classroom for about 15 years. Uh, and then I uh, went on to Tennessee State for my master's degree, and I was hired um, to be the coordinator of Kids on Stage. Interesting story, you know, most of us as we go into our educational leadership, we're looking for a principalship, an assistant principalship, some way to get in. Um, wasn't just a few months after I'd graduated that my principal mentor came to me and said, you need to interview for this princ assistant principalship, it's perfect for you, it's at a school, the visual performing arts, and I went, yes. So I took the interview, I drove into Mount Pleasant, I really connect with Mount Pleasant, just to be honest. I'm, I'm from a, a coal mining um, town way up in Virginia, and, and it kind of has the same vibe. A lot of 1980 models cars. <laughs> um, so I loved the town when I drove in. I enjoyed the interview. It was a panel interview, and I connected with all the staff. And then they told me the job description. I would be in charge of buses. <laughs> I would be in charge of cafeteria duty and testing. <laughs> And I said, thank you very much for interviewing me today. I wish you all the best of luck. <laughs> so I walked out of the room and said, please don't offer me this job. And I went back to teaching band. A couple months later, I get a call from the central office that said, there's a position we want you to look at. And it was kids on stage coordinator, the exact same school, but doing what I wanted to do all along, uh, which is the arts. That's my passion, and uh, that's what got me started in this position, which rolled over to our STEAM campus. Um, if you don't know anything about Mount Pleasant, I hate that you missed our morning session because Ryan Jackson, Jackson is infectious. Um, I was telling someone earlier that there's days that I drive onto the campus. My office is at the middle school but I'll just swing into the high school parking lot and just go stand in the hallway with him. Just five minutes, and then I'll get back in the car and drive to the middle school. It's, just, it's a great way to start your day. If you know you have one of those rough meetings, he's the, he is definitely um, the voltage behind success, absolutely. Uh, so thrilled to be there and also thrilled to be here. If you're a Twitter follower or a Twitter user, I do have a handle. It's at kidsonstage underscore. Um, there are several kids on stage at Twitter, who knew? Uh, but this is our logo, so if you see this logo of the dancing children, that's the kids on stage from Murray County. What we're going to do today, today we're going to discuss the arts and how infusing arts into your STEM curriculum can help your students. In particular, um, we're going to look at how that curriculum widens the scope of student reach, helps with our diversity for sure. We're going to explore the ways the arts can strengthen student learning outcomes. And we're going to explore how to build a creator culture focused on a STEAM education. Our students consume, 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 whether it's data or material things. They live in a world that products just infiltrate them daily. And it's really important for us as educators to show them a way that they can not just consume, but they can create and really that they can respect. So what's an arts-connected education? Because when you put the A into STEM, you have STEAM. And a lot of people will say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean they just get extra art classes? Does that mean we do cute little projects? Many years ago when I started this work, the staff I was working with had the same question. 
I know what you say, but what does that mean? So as a staff, we developed this phrase. And I know it's a little wordy, but it's all pretty important, and it seemed pretty important to them at the time, and it was really the springboard of the arts integration that's going on in Mount Pleasant now. Um, an arts-connected education, it's educating through natural, meaningful, engaging lessons. How many of us want to do that daily, right? Um, it fosters creativity, teamwork, hands-on learning, and comprehension. Well, you want to do that as well, right? Mm -hmm. It provides a learner with reference points to help abstract thoughts and ideas, make abstract thoughts and ideas concrete while expanding learners' horizons. Abstract thought. Boy, it begins in elementary school. If we have elementary school students that don't know how to skip, <laughs> algebra is hard. Um, if we can get them putting hands-on abstract concepts early on and often thereafter, their learning is, is much easier and definitely much easier for the teachers. But we're talking about an arts-connected education. And these are teachers that were looking at integrating the arts into their subject area. And this is what they've said about it. This sentence, the words in black, is what they've said about it. What do you not see? Art. Not one time. Art. I questioned them about it. So guys, they pay me a lot of money to be your arts coordinator, and we're going to put a phrase on our building. We're going to put a phrase on the Internet. We're going to say, this is what we do, and you're going to leave art out of it? Oh, they come back. And they had a reason. And when they gave me their reason, I couldn't disagree with them. For many of them, and they've been, they had been doing this work for three to four years at the time, for many of them, the simple word art stopped them from being creative. It was a fear. It was a, I'm not an artist. So what, I don't dance, I don't sing, I can't draw. The word art was a block. It was a mental block to them in doing this work. But what they found out was when they got into the work, they didn't have to be an artist. They became artists. But they didn't want anybody else to feel that block. So I tell you that today because I want you to understand if you're in here and you're going, but I can't draw, that's okay. You can't sing, that's okay. There's a lot of other things about arts integration. Look at what it does. Engages students, uses teamwork, hands-on learning. These are all things good teachers do anyway. Okay. This is one of my favorite parts of the day, and I'm going to say it's right after lunch, so we're all going to have to get up. Do me a favor. Come join me. You don't have to bring your bean bag. I think there's enough of us that we can use one. Everybody familiar with this? Anybody not seen a bean bag before? <laughs> I, I have to ask. I mean, okay, let's just pass it around. Just feel it in your hand. See what happens with that bean bag. Oh, well, they call it a bean bag. That's in, you know what? Your students are going to pick that. I think it's probably full of sand. Yes, mine did too. Mm -hmm. So we've had some experience there. Some of us have probably done this, right? So you know how to toss a bean bag? Toss it to your friend. There we go. We're getting some experience. Anybody not ever tossed a bean bag? Uh, you'd be surprised. I've had adults that have not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, that's pretty low stress, right? Most people can be successful with a bean bag, and there's a little humor to it if it drops, but it's not a big deal. But what if this bean bag were a football, and I handed you the football? How would you throw that football? I hope. Oh, okay. Anybody over there catch a football? You can catch a football. Show me catching the football. Okay, so she's caught the football. What if that football turned into a basketball. How would you throw that back? How would you pass that basketball? Okay, we'd bounce it. Look, she caught it. She <laughs> caught it. Good. What if that basketball became a volleyball? Like it. Okay. What if it became a beach ball? All right. We've got, 
We've got some experiences going on there. What if it became the sun? How would you catch the sun? With your clothes. <laughs> show me. Show me in your body. How would you catch that sun? Okay. Yeah, good. Look around at what you're paying for. Why are we doing this? Because the sun's what? Big and hot. Okay. What if we were catching an atom? What would we do? How would we look? What if we were catching a butterfly? Right. Now, how many of your students have felt an atom? How many of them felt a, the sun other than the rays? How many of them touched a butterfly? Some may have touched a butterfly. Others probably have not. They can't conceptualize what they don't know. So how we get them to understand the learning is by starting with something simple. Either they've had experience with the beanbang or they've not, but you can give them that experience really easy. And then you can transfer that to what else do you know? Well, our kids probably know a football, right? But they don't know how that butterfly is going to land or what an atom. And here's my favorite little second grader. What's an atom? Look it up. They went straight to the computers. How much does it weigh? And they're looking up. So then they come back to us. And it just, that research took three minutes. They were quick on those computers. And I said, okay, now you've got my answer. How would you catch it? Is it big? Is it small? Is it tiny? So, they're, so that, you know, that's different. And then, so we went to the sun. We started with the atom that day. I said, well, what about the sun? How much does the sun weigh? Well, they could think big, but they couldn't think how big. So then they had to do a little bit of math and say, well, how many trucks would that be? Um, and it's just a way of starting where everyone has a comfort. If you start them at a comfort level, then you can get them outside of their box willingly <laughs> without pulling and forcing. Okay? All right. So that is, when does a bean bag more than a bean bag? When you need the bean bag to be the earth because you need them to know how much the earth weighs. So then you can start with your bean bag. All right. That's my first on your feet. We're going to do a little bit of that. The next thing you're probably going to want to be at tables with at least two people. I really like this little girl. She reminds me of my own children. I have three. My oldest just graduated high school. Wish me luck. She's headed to Southern Miss in the fall. 17 years old. She has her first apartment. Not ready for this. Um, my two other ones are middle school age, high school, right entering high school. But this is kind of what they look like as, as little children and I love them. You know, we all have that person we love, right? And I can think of them at this age, and I can think about what it was about them physically that I closed my eyes that I saw. So that's what I want you to do. Think about who you love. Could be your children, could be your spouse, could be your mom, your dad, <laughs> Mel Gibson, I don't know. Find someone you love. George Clooney. George Clooney. Now, please realize... This is a lesson for adults. If I was teaching this lesson to high school students, I wouldn't teach it the same way. I'd modify it. This is for you. Think about the person you love, and I want you to think about their most attractive physical feature. Their lips, their earlobes, their hands, their shoulder blades. But remember, this is for teachers. Okay? Now, you're going to notice on your table, everybody should have crayons and pink paper. I don't care what color you use, so you're going to draw a picture of the person that you love where the feature that you most admire is enhanced. enhanced. Wow, I have some good artists in this room. Okay, I want you to just pause for just a moment. Take a, take a few seconds and show your picture to a partner, one buddy partner. That's all I'm asking. But here's the assignment. The only thing that buddy partner needs to try to do is identify the enhanced feature. Okay, great. Now give a little bit of feedback. If that feature is hard to identify, give them some suggestions. So at this point, you may or may not want to make changes to your own art. Okay, I've gathered all of your work. 
I've put it in a display. So now we're going to take what's called a gallery walk. I'm just going to quickly walk. Well, not too quickly that you're not paying attention. Take a walk around the table that's displaying our lovely work and see if in each one you can identify the enhanced feature. So let's talk just a moment. What do you see when you look at the work? Variety. Variety. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the features? Yes. You, there was intention in this drawing, right? How did you feel when I asked you to draw a picture? No. No Nervous. A little awkward, right? I can see that. And some of your students will feel the same way. Um, I try to always tell them if I'm going to display their work so that they have a chance not to put their name on the front. Mm -hmm. Not displaying the work is not an option. Uh, because it's important, and I, I want our students to display their artwork as well as I want them to display their written work. Um, and a gallery walk is a great way to do that. I try to always scaffold by giving them a moment to get with a buddy. Hey, what do you, can, can you see this? Just a quick feedback so that they can come back and make any adjustments. Um, but this is, this is our gallery walk. I love to see these all displayed together. And it's a great opening part of the year. Okay, have a seat and I'll explain to you how that lesson began. That quick little lesson followed through the creative process. The creative design process is how artists create artwork, musicians create musical work, but it is also how engineers create everything else. The creative process and the engineering design process are really the same process. Mm -hmm. We started using it in an education a few years back at Mount Pleasant, um, and it's given us a way to include art practices in classrooms that were really hesitant, because it's an engineering design process. Some of them really were able to reach the engineering side a little faster than the art side. It started with a challenge, an inspiration. What was my challenge to you? Draw a feature. Yeah, draw. Think of the person that you love and what feature do you admire the most? So we did some imagining, we did some generating, whether that was in our minds or maybe on a scrap piece of paper. I saw some of you think, well, maybe I need a few pieces of paper. That's okay. We did some planning and focusing, although this was short, so not much. Some exploring, do I want a big head? Do I want a small head? Mm, I don't like that, let's try something different. We produced a preliminary piece of work and then we revised it. Not all of us revised it, some of us were happy. Well, some artists are happy with their first part as well. We presented it and we reflected and evaluated. All through that process, I noticed the conversations at your tables. Some of those were prompted by me saying, get with a buddy. Some of those occurred naturally. Let them occur. It's a natural part of the process. Oh, I like what you're doing. Oh, I wonder if you could, those are natural. That's the way we as adults work. Our students are really no different. That little bit of chatter sometimes moves, moves lessons along more than it hinders lessons. And then it reflects back to another challenge, another inspiration. This lesson started for me two years ago when I was called to fill a leave for a science teacher, an eighth grade science teacher. She was called away from the school unexpectedly. She was going to be out the rest of that day and the next day. Now, I don't know about where you work, but where I'm at, Mount Pleasant, substitutes get lost. So it's very rare that we have a full group of substitutes. It's not uncommon for administrators to have to fill classes. So it was one of those days that I was feeling for this eighth grade science teacher, who, by the way, is fantastic. And she had left this assignment for her students. It was a written test. They had obviously already studied about the life cycle of the darkling beetle. My role, simply to take up the test. But after the first class, what am I doing? I'm reading the answers. What do you think I got out of this? Typical eighth grade student, what's their answers going to be like? Just the rote memorization of what that was. I got 
a lot about the life cycle of a darkling beetle. From the start to the end, some of them drew me fancy pictures because I'm the arts coordinator and they thought that would help them. I found very little focus on the role of the mealworm in the cycle of the darkling beetle. Some of them didn't even talk about a mealworm. And I'll be honest, I had to find a book and look it up. But uh, their focus wasn't there. And these were some of our brighter students. So I handed the papers back and said, let's try this again. And we did this quick little lesson that you just did on drawing a feature. Now for them, we drew the feature of their favorite car or for most of them, their iPhones. <laughs> um, but it worked, it worked really well. And then I had them rewrite the assignment. I love this quote. When we direct our attention to exploring masterworks, we borrow the eyes of genius. And this is the masterwork that I pulled for this lesson. Uh, this, this portrait is still hanging in New Orleans Museum of Art. This artist was probably challenged with much the same challenge you were. What was their emphasis? Long neck. You see the eyes? Why would you think the long neck? What points you to a long neck? It looks, it looks like it's, it looks like it's it, it is. It's exaggerated down, has a definite point. It starts with a point. The nose is an angle straight down. Um, it's in the middle of the picture. It is the brightest part of the picture. So that's what draws our eyes. Maybe you really like necks, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't done the research. It could have been the artist, or it could have been the artist painting for someone that says, this is the feature I admire the most in this person. So I'm not really sure the story there. I, one day I'll look it up. That'll be a new session. Uh, but for the eighth grade students, they came to this pretty quick. They came to the understanding of the neck pretty fast. And then we could talk about, how did you know that? Well, he emphasized it. Okay. Here's my challenge to you, eighth grade students. Did you emphasize what you're being asked to emphasize in your writing? I didn't say anything about the darkling beetle. I didn't say anything about the mealworm. I just asked, where was your emphasis? Reread that question, and where was your emphasis? And the writing improved. Um, so sometimes we just have to take our time and stop and look at the pictures. Mount Pleasant uh, STEAM campus. I want to talk to you just a few minutes about some of the wonderful things that we have going on there. Here's some of the examples. Uh, down here in the bottom, this is our elementary students. One of the things they've committed to this year is their students do the news every morning. And they've uh, worked multiple ways on how to get the news out. They've tried Skype. They've tried a few different methods. Um, and that's been a design process all in itself, but they're committed. The students collect the news, they write the news, they record the news, and they troubleshoot the teacher's computers when it doesn't work. So it's, it's completely in the hands of students, and we just love that about them. Um, over here, or up here to the top left, we call it a STEAM campus, although we are three separate schools. But many of our lessons and our activities involve students from all three campuses and faculty from all three, camp all three schools. So it's not uncommon for, to have staff or students walking between schools. Um, and what you'll see here is Mr. Armin Bechtrup, who is the mechatronics uh, teacher at the high school. He's in charge of our STEM, part of our STEAM campus. So they call him my better half. Um, and I, he probably is. Um, so this is him, and he is actually at our middle school because our middle school students were doing a demonstration on their STEAM components. So he walked over for the day, and he brought several of his high school students with him. Uh, just pulled them and said, come on, we've got to go encourage our middle school students. And they walked all the way around to each student's table giving feedback, encouragement, positive comments, took pictures, put them on Twitter. Uh, we do have all of the rights to our students, so we make sure that that's taken care of. Uh, but that's so powerful for our students to see him. One is he's quite different than some of the other teachers our students are familiar with. And uh, just to be honest with you, our students in Mount Pleasant Every year we bring them to Nashville to see a play. And that's part of the Kids on Stage commitment to students in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, is to get them seeing live performances. I really choose Nashville for two reasons. One, the performances here are quite good. Um, and two, about 50% of our students have never been to Nashville. 
Think about that. We're 60 miles away. They've never seen the capital. They've never seen a taxi cab. They don't know how to cross a city street. So we, that's some of the things in fifth grade that we cover. We get there early. We park on, on by the Capitol building. We get them off the bus. We, uh, we show them how to cross the street safely. We show them a city map. I've been known to hail a taxi, let them look around. Whatever we have to do, we take them to the fountains. We explain to them why they can't put their hands in the water. I mean, it's, it's things that students that grow up in that environment know from small, small ages. But our students, a lot of our students just don't have that opportunity. Uh, we take them to the public library if we get a chance so that they know what the public library looks like here. Believe me, the public library here and the public library in Mount Pleasant is a world of difference. And our students need to know that there's variety. So that's some of the things that we're committed to doing. So when Armin Becktrip walks in um, with his with yarmulke on, our students notice a difference, big difference to them. But when he spends time talking with them and encouraging them and saying, what if you did this? How about that? Great job. I'm coming back tomorrow to see if it works again. They're all over it. They eat it up. They're like sponges. Um, so this is part of our middle school projects. This middle box here, um, this is a teaching artist from uh, Tennessee Performing Arts Center. We work with Tennessee Performing Arts Center quite a bit uh, to bring teaching artists down for our students yet again, trying to get them exposed to different people, different viewpoints. Um, and it's also powerful for our teachers as well because they can take a different role in that education process. These were 90 minute lessons and what our students are doing is they're standing backstage. We have a screen in front and then this is the audience on the other side of the screen and they're manipulating objects backstage to be projected in the front. And then they have peers in the front that's giving feedback. So just the way objects move um, was a huge part of this lesson. Uh, we are pretty fortunate at the middle school to have fantastic facilities, I will say that. Uh, but our students, we want, them, we want them touching it. We want them doing the projects, not just watching the projects. This one down here was an eighth grade science unit. They'd been studying mixtures. So we had turned it into a, a arts integrated projects, mixtures and visual art. And they are, as you've probably heard from Dr. Jackson, we are uh, co-oping with Omar College of Design. We have a huge number of students that are interested in fashion, and our eighth grade science teacher knew that. So she started working with the, eighth, with the uh, visual art teacher in designing this lesson. So the students designed um, paper and fabric that were all marbled by the students. So they went with mixtures, how things moved, and then she brought in milk and dye, and, or milk and food coloring, and then they did that part. Um, and then the visual art teacher said, okay, so now you understand how it works. Let's really use some projects. So she brought out her dyes and silk scarves. Oh, the fact that our students could marble dye a silk scarf. Some of them probably never had a silk scarf. And then they could wrap it up and give it to their mom for Mother's Day. Oh, right. So, and it was beautiful. I will say this is my daughter and that's my silk scarf. So, yeah. So I, I will throw that one in there. Uh, up here, another project I'm really proud of. We do teach arts in all three of our schools. Until last year, the only arts at our elementary and middle school were visual art and high school band. Not our middle school, elementary and high school. They had visual art in elementary school. Then they had visual art or band at the high school level. That was it. Now, our middle school, they come to us in fifth grade. They take dance, visual art, drama, choir, band, and one more. They take everything. Dance, drama, choir, band, and visual art. They take all five art forms as a fifth grader. Every day they take something different. We do combine choir and band in fifth grade, so they get one day of PE. Now, when we first started this, I had a lot of fathers that said, my son is not taking dance. 
okay, we called it movement. Your son is now taking movement. <laughs> so they, it, it's worked for years. Every student takes it. Every student loves it. At the end of their fifth grade year, our students in middle school get to choose what they want to take. Guess what 96% of them put as their first choice? Dance. They love it. They love the others as well, but that seems to connect to fifth graders because they like to move. Um, but we do that. Now, when we first started, remember, our elementary kids came to us with nothing but one day of visual art a week. And they left us after four years of art every day to go to a high school that had band and visual art once a week. It's really hard. Um, we had a group of parents that decided that wasn't good enough. So they got together and said, we're going to make this happen. We're going to change. And these are the parents. You saw our stats. You saw where we came from. You saw our ACT score. I've been there for seven years now, and I can tell you the darkest of times were dark. I've been in the high school when it was a scary place to be. I've stood as the eighth grade name caller at eighth grade recognition, calling our students out, knowing the top 10% of our students were going to walk out of our door and ride into the private school two miles down the road. It's hard. It's hard when they say, why are the test scores at the high school so bad? And I say, because all of our students go to the private school. How do you stop that? You change the culture. That's how we stop that. We went from 10% of our students every year leaving to go to private school or another school option to 1%. Yes, 1%. I'm thrilled. And I'll be honest with you, this little girl, I don't live in Murray County. I drive in. She wouldn't have went to Mount Pleasant two years ago. She's going there this year as a freshman. Thrilled to have her there. Not only is she going across the street to Mount Pleasant High School as a freshman, but she can now take band or choir or dance or drama just like she, or visual art just like she could have at the middle school. Every opportunity we have at one, we now have up at the high, at the high school. And our elementary school has everything except dance, which next year we hope is part of their PE curriculum. So it's been a huge, huge improvement for us. So the first thing I want you to remember when you leave here today is the A in STEAM is hugely important. And if you want the A in STEAM to work, you have to build your arts curriculum to make sure that it happens. Because this lesson and this lesson and this lesson and this lesson and this lesson wouldn't have happened without an art teacher they necess didn't necessarily teach the lesson, but they were there for the regular classroom teacher to say, let me help you. They were that springboard. So don't forget, A in STEAM is important, but the A is important by itself as well. Uh, okay, to this lesson here. We do have high school band. We have had for a while, and we're thrilled that um, our programs are growing. However, we're still growing, which means we still have quite a few needs. One of the needs is mouthpieces. I don't know if they eat them, if they throw them away. I, I don't know. I taught band for 14 years. I had the same problem. They disappear. We have an ingenious student who realized uh, his friend who played baritone couldn't pay $36 for a baritone mouthpiece. So this student was going to quit band. He said, I can't do it anymore. I can't afford another mouthpiece. The young man was also in Project Lead the Way. They had a brand new, so excited 3D printer. He said, I'm going to make you one. This kid laughed at him. He said, no, really, I'm going to make you one. So he sat down in class and made a baritone mouthpiece. I walk down the hall and see the two students standing. The Megatronics classroom is here. The band room is here. And they're standing in the middle. And my first thought of, why are you out of class without a hall pass? And then I saw he's holding a 3D printed mouthpiece. Went, wow, this is amazing. I said, what are, what's, tell me your story. Um, so they explained to me that they needed a mouthpiece, so they just went and printed one. And of course, instrumental music person here, my first thought was, it's not going to play. Um, I said, okay, let me see it. So I picked it up, put it in the baritone, and it played. It played well. It didn't play perfect, but it played well. So we've since connected this young man and his partner, uh, his friend here, with a mouthpiece maker that's going to be in the building with us at the beginning of next fall, a couple days, that he's going to bring his mouthpieces and he's going to show them a few things on, on how to perfect their design. 
Um, it would not have happened except this student said, I have a problem, we're going to fix the problem. Yeah, so it's now going to be part of their lesson. Eighth grade, I, I can't say enough about our teachers. This lesson was eighth grade quilt block project. Uh, this, this teacher is Miss Deanna Hall, eighth grade science. She's fantastic. Um, Miss Cheryl Jelonic, she's our visual art teacher. She uh, comes to us from New York City. She's had several shows and she, her, her art is amazing. And she is by far the most patient teacher I've ever met. Um, they got together after many, many weeks of going over the periodic table and the eighth graders knew all the data that their little minds could stand, but still uh, we weren't happy with the results of what they were able to tell us about the periodic table in our conversations, because it's more than just what they can write on the paper. It's what's the conversation in the hallway. So if I pull your student and I say, what are you learning in science? And you're just gonna give me, uh, we worked on the periodic table, but if you can't tell me something about it, I know it's not sinking in. And her kids couldn't really tell her what she wanted them to know about the periodic table. So she came in one day with a bunch of quilts right out of her house. I think they were family quilts for the most part. And they worked on uh, studying how quilts are put together, design, all in design process. Now we've used quilt process design in math class before, but never really in science. Um, then the next day we went to the science lab and I had pre-cut 120 boards and colored them yellow, blue, and green. And you remember back here to where we were doing our marbling? When the kids marbled their scarves, we also had them marble four sheets of extra paper. So every kid had to do four sheets of paper plus a scarf. When we did our project with our individual boards, which by the way, the seventh, eighth grade uh, science teacher just threw them all in a hat. The kids had to draw one out of a hat. Fair is fair. We had 108 students, so several students did two. They cut out most of their letters from their marbled paper. So it's, it's paper that they had created. Then they had to do the design. They had to come up with the picture. They had to come up with the, where it's going to go, what that means. And then they had to write about it. And I've taken the written part off of these because I had them displayed. And I'll show you that in a minute. But then we displayed them. This is our cafeteria. Everybody on your table has one of these. And these are the actual boards. So if you want to pick them up and take a look, feel free. So you can tell, it's really hard from a picture to tell scale, but once you're holding this up, you can tell how large this was in our cafeteria. Stayed up for half the year. I'm going to tell you our 5th, 6th, and 7th graders know their periodic table because <laughs> they sat and ate lunch staring at it every day for half a year. At the end of the year, we had our 8th graders sign up for uh, high school classes in that room facing the periodic table. So after they signed up for their high school classes, they one by one, without being prompted, took their parent up and showed them their board. And the parent automatically goes, ooh, can we take that home? And the students go, no, no, they stay at the school. So the students knew this, this work we created, but we created for someone else. Uh, it was really a powerful moment. Uh, it was great. I had one student that picked up the wrong colored board. And the science teacher, I didn't bring the picture. The science teacher said, well, wait, we got to, I said, no, 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 no. This is how we learn. <laughs> Let them do it. So we let them do the whole design process. I hung it up in the cafeteria. I brought the student in before anyone else because I didn't want him to be embarrassed. And when this board right here was bright yellow, he realized he'd done something wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I gave him a chance. I said, I'm, you know, we're not, it was, that was in the afternoon. I said, it's not going to be displayed till tomorrow at breakfast. So you can go home tonight and redo it and bring it back to me. He brought it back. I hung it up. Then we opened it up to everyone. Um, it was easy to put up, to be honest. It's painter's tape. You put painter's tape on the wall. You put hot glue on the painter's tape. Because if you put hot glue on the wall, your assistant principal will not be happy with you. Because remember, they're the ones that's dealing with books and butts and everything else. Uh, but that was a quick and easy way to get everything um, designed. I will tell you this story. Um, Kids on Stage Foundation, who supports me 100%, they pay my position for Murray County Schools. They've been doing so for seven years. They do so so that there's an added administrator on the Mount Pleasant campus to handle um, anything arts related. Uh, they are supported solely by Smelter Services, who is an aluminum smelting company. Now, Smelter is a fantastic company. A lot of our students have parents who work at Smelter. The student who drew aluminum, random 108 draw, 
His daddy worked on the floor. So when he came, he brought molted aluminum. So, uh, well, it wasn't molted, but that was the drop from aluminum where they loaded the truck. So I always try to make sure I bring his in. And I brag on him to his dad every chance I get. Another technology uh, arts integrated lesson that we're pretty proud of happened last year. We studied the Civil War in fifth grade. We have multiple arts integrated STEAM lessons that we do with the Civil War. We have a huge Civil War night. They, all the students do some kind of art form. They all create some project. This year we focused on technology. So they built hot air balloons. Uh, they built telegraph machines, any kind of technology that was in the Civil War. Well, after the Civil War project unit, they started bugging the teachers because they wanted to build cannons. So we built cannons. We built potato cannons, to be specific. <laughs> we have four uh, fifth grade classrooms from last year, and each classroom divided into two teams, the North and the South. Random draw. We don't let them pick any other way, so it's a random draw. And they built their own cannon. So on the last day of school before Christmas break, when everybody has parties, we don't really do that. Uh, we, as a school, went outside and had our cannon wars <laughs> between classrooms. No, we did not shoot at each other, uh, but we did set up hay bales in the field and let them uh, fire their cannons and chose a winner. Uh, the great thing about these is they were 100% free for us. We went to individual companies, like this one here is from Sundrop. You probably see the logo. Sundrop Bottling Company. We had the vendor come in one day and we said, hey, we need you to sponsor a potato cannon. He said, okay, how much is it going to cost me? And handed us $50, so we went and bought supplies. Um, we did the same thing for uh, eight, seven other co corporations that help us out locally. So all of the cannons were paid for. Uh, we had kids that donated old bicycles. They brought in tons. We said, that, how many of you have a bicycle you're not using? Some of them I know we'd given them for Christmas a few years before, so that was okay. Uh, so we took the tires off and, and used the bicycle tires. These are our fifth grade boys, fifth grade boys and girls, not just boys. This just happened to be a team of boys. Uh, built potato cannons. So I will tell you, when you have 450 students standing in the freezing cold weather, shooting off potato guns, it makes for a very exciting time. Um, we thought they would go about 100 yards. They went about 300 yards. So we're, uh, we were pretty happy with that. At the end, we sold those up for auction. One of our fifth grade teachers' husband was uh, having an issue with cancer, so we were doing a spaghetti supper for him, and the student said, we want to auction our cannons. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. So I, I purchased this one. The Sundrop Cannon now lives in my office. Uh, the kids like to come and borrow it every once in a while. But uh, so we do, we did build the Civil War cannons. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's not traditional Civil War. No, but we'd already completed our Civil War project. This was a different branch, but they connected it from one to the other. Um, it was also connected from class to class. It was social studies, science, and project lead the way. All three teachers gave time. Um, they wrote about uh, the building process for their English teacher. They wrote about the day when we fired them off when they came back after uh, the holiday break. So um, the kids are, as a matter of fact, that's probably what some of them are still talking about today. Okay, I'm going to take a break for just a moment, but here's what I need you to do. On your table, you're going to see a picture. It's a Norman Rockwell picture. What I would like for you not to do is turn it over. So just look at the front, not the back. And I want you to talk with your team for just a minute. And what I want you to come to is a title for this individual picture. She's just coming in. Oh, she has. She still has her mm -hmm. coat on. Mm -hmm. Vacation. Take a look with me here. I love Norman Rockwell. One of the many reasons I love Norman Rockwell is he is very um, acceptable. He has multiple different pieces of work. You can find tons of his, uh, his uh, pictures for free. 
Um, they're often used in calendars, which is what you're looking at. It was part of a calendar that I just laminated. Um, and it's, it's something almost everybody is familiar with to some level. What do we see this guy? If we had to title this one, what would we call him? I would call him Inventor yeah. what, what do you see in there that would you call him an inventor? His tools. His tools. His tools. His tools. Yeah. Okay. It says invention here, doesn't it? Right? Well, what about him personally? Right. So he's, he's conflicted, for sure. Okay. He's working on something mechanical. Great. Oh, that might be a small version. He's going to make a large one. You could be right. I'll tell you, I don't know the official title to this, but one of my favorites came from a high school boy that we did this in a science class, and he said that's called productive struggle. Oh, very nice. What is it called? Motion? Yeah, that could be the title too, but he, that young man called it productive struggle, and I thought, oh, wow, wonderful for him. He figured it out. What do you see in yours? Uh, let's see, which table would like to go first for us? Um, I believe they're fighting over the same fellow. So Willis must die. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And what in the picture makes you think that they're fighting over the same fellow? They both have the same picture. They're holding the same picture and pointing, the, pointing to the same. And looks like they might be arguing. There we go. What about this one? We call this 13 going on 30 because it looks like a young teenage girl with her doll writing in her diary maybe, but it looks like she's wearing her mother's evening clothes and trying to be a little more grown up than she is. What about you ladies? We called this, we had, we had, a, we can relate to this, you know, exhausted vacation. We called it vacation exhaustion. That's right. Nice. And this one? We call this Miss Jones' birthday, but I also called it um, Apples of My Eye because she's come into a birthday surprise from her, t her kids. That's great. It's a great teacher title as well. You know that feeling. Your kids surprise you. How do you have time to collaborate so that it all meshes together? I mean, that's what I see as the biggest hindrance where I'm at. I mean, and, and and I think you have to just accept that there is only a certain number of minutes in the day and that some of those are identified for specific reasons. <laughs> um, so there's just not a lot. You can't build more time into a day. You can't build more time into a year. But what you can do is understand that if it's important, you're going to find the time. Um, a lot of our planning is not face-to-face -face planning. Science teacher and visual art teacher that planned that lesson might be the only two teachers I have that plan together, and that's just because both of those are face-to-face -face people. Um, the other t most of my other teachers plan through email. They plan through texting. Um, they'll pass lesson plans back from box to box. It says, I'm going to do this on this day. Can you address this on that day? Um, they'll, they'll send me emails and says, can you manipulate the schedule so we can have these same kids for 90 minutes at this time? And either I'll say, yes, I'll make it work, or no, let me see if I can get a substitute for one of you. Uh, but if, if it's something you value and it's a worthy lesson to be taught, you're going to find the time to teach it. Uh, take a chance the first year. If, if it's something that interests you, take a chance. You're going to know, did it work, did it not? If it worked, do it again. Because uh, it'll work the next year because then you've polished it, right? And the students depend on it. The students that did the, this project, are now sophomores in high school, okay? The eighth graders this year didn't get to do this project. They were heartbroken. They got to do another project. They didn't get to do this one. So the seventh graders, the ones moving in this year, they've already asked for it. They said, we've already been studying. So they're, they're ready. It builds, uh, it builds from year to year, especially if you display student work. But to answer your question, uh, we can't create more time. We can just value the time we have. Um, 
I would say just understand, we all know in education there's certain things you have to do during your planning time. There's certain things you have to do during structured um, PD for your district. That's not going to change. But can you fit this type of education into your classroom? You can. Here's my advice to you. Dream big, but start small. Start with a project that you can accomplish by yourself in your classroom or with one friend or advice in your classroom with your group of students. Build from that success. When you're successful, when you're displaying good work and your students are talking about your lesson in the hallway, that's when you know you need to move on. When they're going next door and telling the other teachers about what you did, the other teacher is going to come to you and say, I want to be part of this. Then build a lesson with them, and it'll grow from there. Thinks in terms of student and community needs. Obviously, in Mount Pleasant, we have needs that are different than students that you teach. We probably have students that don't have some of the needs that your students do. So think in terms of student needs. One of the things that drives us to make sure our students come to Nashville is that they need that experience. One of the things that drove this project is they needed to have a conceptual understanding of how to put things together so that they could talk about it. They needed to have a reason to talk about the elements other than the fact they're studying them in a book. So that was our student needs. Uh, build your arts program, and I talked to you about that earlier. The A in STEAM is huge, but it will not be as effective if your students don't have access to the arts. I was committed when I came on into Mount Pleasant that 100% of our students would have access to the arts every week. 100%. Not 97, not 98, 100%. So that meant our CDC students, that they don't like to bring them out to other classes sometimes, they come to arts classes. If they can't come to an arts class successfully, we build an art class and take it to them. They're going to have the arts absolutely going to have the arts. So 100% of our students in middle school have that opportunity. 100%, well, they have it every, every week. Uh, most of our students take art classes four to five days a week. Our elementary students, 100% of those have arts classes and our high school has it as they wish. So if they sign up for a class, that's, that's great. They all have to take at least one. Um, we send students over to our high school to help with our special ed population over there because we've had those babies in the middle school and we know how important dance is to them or visual art is to them. So we can send students over there, or teachers over there to make sure that their needs are being addressed. Um, I will say this, we have a young man that's going to the high school this year. For the last two years, he has been the lead male dancer for us. And the only class he comes out of his special education room for is dance. He is, He's not just a dancer, he is our lead dancer. This young man comes into dance class with 25 of his fellow classmates. We're talking football players, basketball players, cheerleaders. They all come into class together. He's teaching the choreography. Yeah. Then he goes, they take him back to class. He's amazing. So when he goes to high school, he's going to be in dance class. It's not an option. He's got to, and the kids will look for him. They, if he doesn't show up to their class, they will go find him. He's that important to him. So 100%, for me, it's, it's, it's nothing else is an option. We have 100% of arts at our school. Continue to show your appreciation and train your students to do so as well. I will be honest with you, this success wouldn't happen without community support from our Kids on Stage Foundation to the companies that support what we do you know, like I showed you Sundrop Bottling, they are willing to support us they, because they know we appreciate it, not because we give them something back in return always, which we try to, but they know our appreciation and they hear it not just from myself, they hear it from Dr. Jackson, they hear it from our superintendent of schools, but they hear it from our kids and they hear it from their parents. And that's huge. So whenever we do a project, we make sure we say thank you and we make sure we say thank you to the people who made it possible. Um, and in that end, social media, <laughs> I was honestly, a year ago, I was not on Twitter. Well, maybe, I may have had a Twitter page for the Kids on Stage Foundation, 
but I did not use it uh, half of what I should. Uh, Dr. Jackson uh, came in and showed us the importance of social media, and I'm a believer. And, and I'm getting better, <laughs> at least I'm trying to get better with my social media profile there. Uh, but our students understand and they can teach us and we just have to be willing to, to let them help us in some of that. Um, used to be you didn't let your kids on your Twitter feed and now you, you want them on your Twitter feed. So all of our students have our kids on stage Twitter account so they can post pictures for me and, and I encourage them to do that. Um, and um, hopefully this year that will get better as well. But I encourage you to use the social media, make it your friend because it's definitely your student's friend. Um, and that'll, that'll give you a connecting point to show some of their work. Okay, and I believe I've left enough time at the end. I know I've taken a few questions. But there's been an awful lot of information thrown at you. What questions do you have that I can answer? When you're looking for good quality pieces of any type of art, any work at all, where do you start? Where, like if I'm working with a group of teachers and say, let's start to integrate these things, where's the first place that we look? Um, I'll just be honest, I look at the internet because it's free. And it's for an educational purpose. Now I completely believe in paying artists for artist work. Um, as an artist myself, I understand the importance of, of making a dollar and the, the value in the work that they put into art. Uh, but there are tons of free resources online that you can pull up. And it is so much easier to pull things up on a screen to show for an educational uh, lesson than it is to have to purchase it and bring it in. Now, we do have art hanging in our classrooms. We have art in our hallways. Most of our art in our building is student generated. We frame it just like it would be a professional framed piece of work and hang it. But um, for educational purposes, I try to go online. Other than that, you'll notice what I brought in today. It's a calendar. I'm a collector. I collect things. If I think I can use it, I'm going to collect it. So uh, those I grabbed out of the recycling bin and laminated. And I keep them clipped in my bag so I can have them for, for uh, <coughs> sessions. Uh, but that's the thing is, is collect what you need and save it. And, and be a, willing to share it from classroom to classroom. I also have nine large um, matted Norman Rockwell prints that I picked up at a garage sale for $1.50 a piece. Uh, they are still in the plastic, so I take those with me. The kids get a kick out of seeing the, the actual work. Um, so uh, again, I'm just, I'm just a collector. Um, some great sites online. Um, the Kennedy Center. Okay, if you'll Google the Kennedy Center, they have a great resource for you. Most of your larger museums have uh, online pictures that you can pull from. So I, I, I pull those great, like the one that I showed you earlier was from New Orleans, and that is from their site. So it's very available for you, and it's, you're welcome to use that. Um, but the Kennedy Center definitely would have uh, pieces for you, and not only that, they have lesson plans. Do you find that um, local artists, like within your area or whatever, um, are willing to come and um, work with the children? I know when I first went to Rome County, uh, I lived in Cumberland County, and I had run across a, a guy that did pottery. Right. And all we have at our school is music. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything else. And um, so anyway, I invited him in, and I invited a, an author to come in, too, that was had written a book and whatever was published up there. Um, and if so, do you know of some people that would be willing to do that kind of stuff? Um, my best resource for you there is the Tennessee Arts Commission. Uh, you'll get on there, they have an artist roster. Tennessee Arts Commission also has several grant opportunities for teachers that you can pay to have artists come in. I, I've done that, I, I received a thousand dollar grant one year definitely encourage you to use uh, the Arts Commission, um, even just for a resource to connect with local artists in your area. Uh, but the, the grant process is all online now. It's not very difficult, uh, but it is uh, very helpful. If you're especially in a rural community, they get very few submissions from rural communities, and sometimes you'll have a much better chance of getting funded that way. Although I'll say I've never been turned down for funding through them, so almost every time we submit, we get something. 
It, that just reminds me that the story you were telling a minute ago about the lead dancer. Um, when I had the guy come in and do the pottery, he brought in a pottery wheel and everything. Mm -hmm. And some of the kids got to, to play around with that. But I had one student in particular who was a special needs, big, huge black guy. I have never seen, I mean, it, that's what he should be doing, right. you know? And so it was a connection for him. And then I got him private lessons. And so it all worked out really well. When they find that passion, yeah. it, it's, it's contagious for them. Um, because they'll find passion, success, no matter what that stage is. If you can find their success point, it, it just grows. Then they're going to find success somewhere else, especially when that other teacher notices their success. You build a kid up for what they're doing well, they'll do well in all things. <coughs> Any other questions? I have more of, a, of your school's philosophical question okay. for you. I teach middle school and high school art classes, and by the time I get them at that age, they've already kind of developed the mindset of, oh, I can't do this, and it's just, it's like stepping out into new territory, and so they feel like failures. One of the things that I've discovered in art classes is that it, like, helps to challenge students to be okay with that failure, to try something new, even you fail and then learn from that, and then do something great from it. Like, do you, do you have, like, stories about that, or any kind of philosophy that helps? I do. Fortunately for us, at the middle school level, we have it set up where everyone takes everything. So they come in knowing we are all artists. We are all dancers. We are all actors. We are all musicians. We are all visual artists. Um, and there are some students that say, well, I just don't like this or I'm not very good at it. My response to them is always, you know, that's okay. You're going to have some wonderful experiences in fifth grade. And then in sixth grade, you're going to get to decide what you would prefer to do, not what you're better at. I don't talk about in terms of you're not good at something. Uh, I always tell them we're all artists. You took art in fifth grade. My youngest, you took dance in fifth grade. We're all dancers. So they have that little bit of an experience. Um, that does two things for us. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've seen this carry over to the high school as well, but when every student in your building is an artist, the bullying because you're in whatever goes away. Gone. It doesn't exist at Mount Pleasant Middle School because if you're in the band, the kid talking to you is probably in dance or in choir. Yeah, they may be the quarterback on the football team, but they still sing tenor in the choir. You know, it's, uh, so they have that appreciation. Is, it's not an if or, it's an and for us. We are all this. Um, so I, th I think that that builds some camaraderie for us, but it also lets them know um, you don't have to be the best to be in the group. You know, you don't have to be the best artist to be in art class. You're going to learn. You're going to go from where you are, and you're going to improve. And it's that improvement that we're going to celebrate. Um, so that's where we try to take it um, at Mount Pleasant. And I'm seeing that it's being helped, that it's being helped along through our, our elementary school. Uh, our elementary teachers have a great philosophy on getting kids to try new things. Uh, very encouraging, and I, th I think that's the key. It's just the encouragement. We always talk about uh, the positives. We talk about the improvement. We don't talk about the negative side. Yeah. We do grade. My visual art teacher is a beast on her grading. I think the lowest grade she gives is a 91. But uh, she does have a pretty hard standard, and anything that's displayed has to be a 95 or above. And she holds firm to that. Students know if it's not a 95, Ms. Jelonic's not going to show it. Uh, but they work to get to that point. So. Okay, and to finish up for you, again, here's my contact information. I'm almost always available through email, um, so that is there for you. Um, and I am on Twitter at KidsOnStage, the underscore. And when in doubt, look for the Kids on Stage logo with the dancing students. Um, I am thrilled to be part of the Mount Pleasant Arts Innovation Zone. I can't tell you how um, much progress we've made in a very short time. It's been a long way to get there, but we're, we're, we've started to see the turn of the tide and uh, huge things are happening. So stay in contact with us. If I can help you in any way, I'm more than willing to do so. Um, I encourage you again, 
Start small, but take that first step. If this is something you are interested in, and in adding the art to your instruction, then, then give it a try. I don't think you'll be dissatisfied. Okay. Thank you.